Good morning, IPC Hebron. Good morning. Praise the Lord. Welcome to the visitors as well. Um, you know, the greatest gift this world has ever received is our Lord and Savior Jesus Christ. And the greatest gift that you as a personally have received is to accept the Lord Jesus as your Lord and Savior. That is the way to eternal life. And so we've been studying uh, the new and living way for the last many months. And we've studied about the new covenant, the new birth, the new heart, the new fruit, the new family, the new purpose. And now we're here studying, Joe kicked it off last week, new heavens and the new earth. The new heavens and the new earth. Today, I would like to speak to you on a sermon titled, Our Pain Has an Expiration Date. Our Pain Has an Expiration Date. You know, pain is one of the most common reasons that people go to the doctor. Pain is experienced through one of our five senses, touch. And if we lose the ability to, to feel pain, that is also bad. You can't touch something and know that it's hot. So you need pain in this world to live or it would be dangerous. But at the same time, as we get older and older, we realize that our human bodies are frail and uh, that we have chronic debilitating pain sometimes. You know, I'm just in my 40s and I've started to realize that already. And as I see older uh, folks, I see that uh, as my future. Now, is that something that uh, can be avoided? If you suffer from chronic pain, you are not alone. It affects millions and millions of people. Conservatively, around the world, about 10% of the world's population has chronic pain, which lasts more than three months. So if you suffer from it, you're not alone. And if you have chronic pain, there's a higher chance of having sleep disorders and having depression and other co comorbidities. But the word pain appears in the Bible over 70 times in some form or another. And this usage of the word started from Genesis chapter 3, where the Lord uh, uh, God told uh, Adam and Eve uh, that you would, I will greatly multiply your pain in childbirth. In pain, you will bring forth children. Yet your desire will be for your husband, and he will rule over you. Genesis 3.16. And here, the context is Adam and Eve had sinned, and the pain of childbirth uh, had been uh, put as a consequence of their sin upon them. But even if we, uh, so because we are born as human beings, we have original sin, and therefore uh, we are all subject to pain uh, that the earth or nature had to endure, and we as human beings have pain as a part of our life. Jesus Christ also suffered pain, suffering, when he came into this world, uh, taking the form of human flesh. Jesus, the only human who lived upon this earth without committing any sin, had to endure bodily pain and agony like you and me. And he went through the plan that the Lord had for him, the Father had for him, and he was able to endure that suffering and pain. Does this not teach us that as a human being living on this earth, that we must all go through pain and suffering? Amen. John 16, verse uh, 33, uh, talks about that as well, that there's going to be uh, a pain and uh, there's going to be pain and suffering in different times in our life. And as we get older, this is uh, uh, something that is inevitable. So what am I trying to say here then as an introduction? Uh, let us go into the portion that talks about where our pain and suffering will be forever gone. We will go into Revelation chapter 21, verse 8, which gives us the longest, uh, uh, 1 through 8, Revelation 21 and 22 talks about this new heaven and this new earth, and we will study this in a little bit more detail. If you could go to Revelation 21, I'll start reading verse 1 through 8, and we'll go through it. Then I saw here John, uh, the, the apostle John in the island of Patmos, uh, seeing this vision, and he's saying, then I saw a new heaven and a new earth, for the first heaven and the first earth had passed away, and there was no longer any sea, no longer any sea in the new Jerusalem. 
I saw the holy city, the new Jerusalem, coming out of heaven from God, prepared as a bride, beautifully dressed for her husband. And I heard a loud voice from the throne saying, look, God's dwelling place is now among the people and he will dwell with them. They will be his people and God himself will be with them and be their God. He will wipe away every tear from their eyes. There will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the old things have passed away. Let me read verse four again. He will wipe every tear from their eyes and there will be no more death or mourning or crying or pain for the, older, uh, for the old order of things has passed away. He who was seated on the throne said, I am making everything new. And he said, write this down for those words are trustworthy and true. He said to me, it is done. I am Alpha and Omega, the beginning and the end. And to the thirsty, I will give water without cost from the springs of, of the life of the, uh, from the springs of the water of life. Those who are victorious will inherit it and, those, uh, and it, I will be their God and he will be my children. But the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, they are consigned to the fiery lake of burning sulfur. This is the second death. Now, that's a big portion to understand and we'll try to break it down. But it is very clear from this portion that if you are born twice, you only die once. But if you are only born once, you will have a part in the second death. And how you are born again a second time is very familiar to everyone here, including the Sunday school children. But I wanted to reiterate that, that if you are uh, born, uh, born again, accept the Lord as your personal savior and live in relationship with him, then you have no part in the second death. And that would require you to live in relationship with him, sanctifying yourself, uh, undergoing sanctification as we heard last week, and, going, uh, and uh, living and dying in relation with him. And that will be when we have no part in the second death that is talked about. So verse eight says, the cowardly, the unbelieving, the vile, the murderers, the sexually immoral, those who practice magic arts, the idolaters and all liars, uh, they will be the ones that will be partakers in the fiery lake and the burning sulfur. So if you are not partakers in that and you have accepted the Lord Jesus as your personal savior, what will happen to you? If you would put up that uh, slide for me that talks about the chronology of things, um, we talk about uh, where we are currently. We know that the day of Pentecost happened uh, in Acts chapter two, and we are currently in the church age. We don't know how long the church age will go on. Uh, only the Lord knows the, the time, only the Father knows the timing of when he will come again, but there will be a rapture that takes place. The rapture of those who believe on the Lord Jesus who are still alive. So in that church age and also in the Old Testament times, there are people who lived on earth who had died in Christ. Um, so they are not uh, alive at the time of the rapture. Those saints that died in Christ and those who are alive that believe on the Lord Jesus will be raptured together and meet the Lord in the midair. And then the earth will go through a time of tribulation for everyone that is left behind. There will be seven year reign of the Antichrist. And then afterwards, the Lord Jesus uh, with, with the saints will come back and there will be the battle of Armageddon that it talks about in Revelation 19. And there will be a thousand year kingdom age or millennial reign upon the earth. And after that will be the great white throne judgment where uh, there, there, there will be judgment of the saints, those who will receive their reward for all they had done. And then there will be a time of uh, the new heaven and the new earth, which is what we think of as heaven. So if you die in Christ now, where are you? Let's look at the next slide. This talks about how uh, if you are saved and you die in Christ through the narrow gate, uh, and you have accepted the Lord Jesus and living for him and dying for him, then through the narrow gate, you are entering into a place uh, that is called paradise. And then you will uh, be rewarded. And during uh, judgment day, you'll be rewarded and you'll go to heaven as well. But if you are going through the 
wide gate, which is the lost, you will end up in a place of torment, and then you will end up uh, directly going through hell. So there's no, once you enter in, there's no way you could switch. It's, there's, a, there's a wide chasm, as we know about Lazarus and the rich man. Uh, we know that Lazarus was in Abraham's bosom, and the other man was in the place of torment. So we see that there's a wide chasm, and the decision is here while we are still alive, that we can decide, do we want to go through the narrow gate and choose the Lord Jesus, believe on the Lord Jesus, be born again for a second time, so we don't have any part in the second death that we just talked about. But uh, if we are saved and we are going through that narrow gate, uh, we will enter into paradise and at the, at the right time, uh, along with the saints that are still alive, will be, be caught up and we will reign with the Lord uh, and forever and ever in the new heavens and new earth. So what is this new Jerusalem that is talked about? The new Jerusalem is a holy city, a city of God. That's the heaven part. At the very end of a thousand and seven years that will end up in this new Jerusalem. The holy city, the city of God, the celestial city, the tabernacle of God, the heavenly Jerusalem, are the different terms that are given for this. Hebrews 11.10, as Joe mentioned last week, uh, Abraham, looking forward in faith, said, we are looking forward to a city that has foundations whose designer and builder is God. It is described in Revelation 21 and 22 about this new Jerusalem. And at the very end of all age, uh, man will either go to New Jerusalem or will go to the place of hell and burning sulfur that we just read about. So God is uh, uh, doing a complete makeover uh, of heaven and earth, better than any extreme makeover on HGTV. The Lord is making a complete makeover. If you look at verse 1 and 2 of Revelation, it says that the old earth and the old, uh, uh, the old shall pass away and there shall be a new earth and a new heaven. And then in Isaiah 65, verse 15, we see the prophet is saying that this place, I create a new heaven and a new earth. The former shall not be remembered nor come into mind. Isaiah sees a place of gladness, rejoicing, joyfulness, where the animals will live together and no harm will be done to each other. Apostle Paul also talks about this in 2 Peter chapter 3, verse 12. Uh, but according to his promise, we are waiting for a new heaven and a new earth in which the righteous will dwell. I did a little bit more research about this new Jerusalem. It is, uh, uh, Bible scholars say, about 1,400 meters long, wide, and high. To put that into perspective, it is a cube, essentially. And if you take the, the space from New York all the way to Houston, and then also go in the other, other direction towards uh, Montana. That'll be the length and the width, but then there's also the height. Uh, if you want to go to space, it's only about 70 something miles. So 1400 miles is way taller. And so there's so much real estate. If you don't have any real estate on earth, you don't need to worry because the Lord has so much real estate for us. If uh, there's Bible scholars who have counted it that said, that even if every person that has lived on the earth has accepted the Lord Jesus, which we know is not true, there's a bigger crowd going to hell because wide is the gate, uh, that there will be much real estate for each one of us. The ultimate fulfillment of God's promise and God's uh, goodness is manifest in New Jerusalem. So who will be the residents of this New Jerusalem? It'll be God's redeemed children who have entered through the narrow gate, who, who uh, have died in Christ or were living for him at the time of the rapture. Uh, that is who will end up in New Jerusalem. This kingdom in New Jerusalem will be in contrast to the powers of this world, Babylon, that is mentioned in Revelation 17. And the people of this world will go to the lake of fire and sulfur that we just read about in verse 8. So as a summary of this portion that is in Revelation 21, verse 1 through 8. Uh, let me say there are four points that I'd like to bring out. I want you to imagine with me, if you get to New Jerusalem, what will be that experience like? You will be overjoyed by the dazzling beauty. You will be overjoyed by the dazzling beauty. If you study Revelation 21 and 22, you'll see 
that it has foundations of precious stones. There is streets of gold. There is gates of pearl. There is light of the glory of the Lamb of God that will light up the place. And in the center of that city will be a tree of life. And the leaves of that tree will be the healing of the nations. And there will be a river of life that flows out from the throne, throne of God. So it will be uh, a place of dazzling beauty that we will be overjoyed with. And that's not anything, that's an exaggeration because it is directly out of Revelation 21 and 22. And then we will be overwhelmed by its holiness. In just as just this two portions, Revelation 21 and 22, three times it talks about how this is a holy place. A holy place. So uh, people that are not holy have no part in this. And we become holy by the righteousness of the blood of Christ. So accepting the Lord Jesus and uh, living for him and uh, living in communion with him daily and uh, being covered in his blood is the way. There will be no lies there. There will be no shady deals, no politics, no foul words, no evil images. There will be no crime, no violence. It will be a place of pure holiness. Uh, the third thing that is the main focus of my message you will be able to obliterate all the evils or ills of earthly life. There will be no more death. Death will be defeated once and for all in this new Jerusalem. There will be no more mourning. There will be no more tears. There will be no more pain and suffering in new Jerusalem. Amen. But more than any of this, you will be overcome by the beauty of our Savior. And we will see his face, not a veiled face, but we will see his face, face to face. And he will be with us, it says. God will commune with his people like he had desired in uh, Eden and was lost in chapter 3 of Genesis. God is going to be with us and we can forget about everything else. Even though we have streets of gold and we have dazzling beauty all around us, uh, we will not be worried about that. We'll be just worshiping our Lord. We will be looking at the face of the one who saved us, our Savior, and we will be with the Lord forever and ever and ever. While this is something that is in our future, thousands, uh, a thousand or so years uh, after uh, the, the rapture, uh, we will uh, have something to look forward to. In Romans uh, chapter 8, verse 18 to 23, it talks about the future glory that we will have. For I consider the suffering of this present time not worth comparing with the glory that is yet to be revealed to us. For the creation waits with eager longing for the revealing of the sons of God. Even creation, everything in nature is waiting for this. But not only creation, it says, we, the firstborn of the fruits of the Spirit, the ones that have the Holy Spirit, will groan inwardly as we wait eagerly for the adoption of sons, the redemption of our bodies. Yes, we are adopted in Christ, but the final papers of our adoption papers will be signed in New Jerusalem. We will be adopted and be living with him forever and ever. Amen. So our pain on this earth is temporary. Our pain upon this earth is, has an expiration date. Amen. With the eternal hope given to us, we're able to face anything, including pain that comes our way in this temporal and fleeting world. A Christian may groan, yet he has a hope that one day he will live pain-free, eternally, forever and ever with the Lord. Let me repeat that. A Christian may groan. That word is sustenazo, which means the pain or the groaning of childbirth. There is trouble upon this earth. And it is not just because of Adam's sin. That is what the Lord said. You will have trouble in this world. Even the Lord Jesus, who was without sin, had to go through trouble. So there will be sickness. There will be cancers. There will be other problems in this world. Yes, but we are groaning. We are waiting eagerly for a future place where we will not have any more pain where we will not have any more suffering let us keep that eternal perspective as we go forward i want the worship team to come up and as we will look at a, a, a uh, song and certain lyrics together um, soon and very soon as the worship team's coming up you're welcome to stand to your feet 
soon and very soon written, to, written by Andre Crouch. Soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Yes, no more crying there. We're going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. No more dying there. We're going to see the king. Hallelujah. Hallelujah. We're going to see the king. Then it says, should there be any rivers we must cross? Should there be any mountains we must climb? God will supply all the strength that we need and give us the grace till we reach the other side. We will have people from every nation. God knows each of us by name. Jesus took his blood and he washed our sins and he washed them all away. Yeah, there are some of us who have laid down our lives, but we all shall live again on the other side in New Jerusalem. Oh, soon and very soon, we're going to see the king. Hallelujah, hallelujah. We're going to see the king. There is an expiration date for our pain, child of God. Yes, there is suffering in this world. But as we go forward, we can look to that eternal blessed hope that there will be a day that, will live, that we will dwell with the Lord forever and ever. And a thousand years will be like a day. A thousand years will be like a day. So let's worship him. The one who gave his life for us. The greatest gift that we can ever achieve. So that we can have eternal life. May God bless you all with these words. Amen.